This is my favorite commercial. It goes like this. There's a bouncy southern acoustic riff accompanied by a man's voice who says, Trajectory, in a sustained gruff tone, like in the movie trailers. Cut to a classroom. It's such a funny word, isn't it? Says the teacher at the front. Denim skirt, denim vest, blouse with an angel on it. The usual first grade teacher who's sweet as cake and makes the best cherry pie in the school. Fold it like this. She's got a piece of copy paper in her hands that she folds and wraps to look like a tall house. The students' little heads seem to bob to the carefree chord progression. Inattentive, they rip and tear the paper. The scraping and slashing overcome the dreadful sample music. Then there's nothing for a minute. This is the best part. All I can hear is the grumble and wheeze of my 2025 sedan, my silver monster. Then the faded monitor at my dash takes on color again. The speakers start a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, says the movie man's voice. A quick flash of light fills the darkness, feathers out. Combustion follows. Gray clouds funnel and choke the flame, try to suffocate it. The fire gets away, runs upward. The camera pans out and we see a rocket on top of the fire. Up and up it goes, ripping and tearing through the puffy skin of God, easy as poking a finger into water. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, says a voice, a voice shaky yet confident. That part, part used to give me goosebumps. I'd give my right kidney, right testicle, and hell, I'd even throw in my useless appendix to know the feeling that voice felt, even for a second. Cut back to the classroom. Little slivers of paper are raining from the ceiling. Careful now, you don't want uneven wings, Miss Denim Angel says, as she reveals that they are constructing paper airplanes. There's a hissing noise as the children fold the paper between their tiny fingers. One of the kids starts waving his arms like a bird. Up and down he goes along the aisle, stomping his little boots into the ribbons of paper underneath. The other kids laugh. Miss Denim Angel chuckles as well. No, it would be like this, she says with one arm outward and the other tucked into her armpit. She spins in a circle and falls on the ground. The kids all giggle and gather to help her up. It's a genuine Hallmark moment. Really sets the mood for the next part. Six, five, four, says the movie man. Cut back to that hungry titanium fire monster. It decided to leave behind its own expensive clouds to make up for the ones it ate through. The camera keeps up as it breaks through every layer that separates us from an infinite void of ambivalence. There's a bassy, heroic theme that starts to make up for silence as the rocket slows above. There's some old beat up satellites floating around where heaven used to be. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe, says a staticky, certain voice. The fact that we can release atomic energy ushers in a new era in man's understanding of nature's forces. A pause. The base shudders and climbs until I can feel the doors of my car shake. It is an atomic bomb. They have been repaid many fold. The rocket lowers its nose and reinserts itself into reality, down and down. A mask of inferno looks like a dragon dancing towards the blue green rock. Three, two, the movie man says. Back at the classroom, there is an air of suspense. The kind of silence that follows something loud, like glass breaking, or a profound thought dropped into mediocrity by overconfidence. This is the most important part, says Miss Denim Angel. Now that the plane is made, the teacher picks her airplane up. The children follow the teacher's lead. Now it is all up to you, she says. Depending on your speed, your angle, and your strength, that will decide your trajectory. One of the kids gulps loudly. Another one looks down admiring their plane and tucks it into their backpack. One of the kids looks around like they're lost, but in fact, they have only lost their paper airplane. Another kid, one with blonde hair and a striped shirt, is shaking with excitement at the prospect of letting his plane loose. On my count now, three, two, but it was too late. The blonde child let go of his plane when the teacher said, now. He watched as his plane went straight into the carpet, folding itself on impact to never be thrown again. Then there was silence. The film becomes grainy and red, zooming out, the camera captures the rocket as it kneels on humanity. One, a flash of light, fire swallows up the screen. Gray clouds funnel and choke the flame, trying to suffocate it. The fire gets away, runs upward, up and up, but there is no rocket this time, only a cloud with wings, stretching out and out, swallowing up the world, the supermarket, the church, the school. The screen is dark, dust rustles around where hollowed out buses sit, 
A fiery plank falls, once attached to the gym. From out of the sky, down and down, a denim vest floats. It lands on the ground, close up, singed into the back, it says, apocalyptic home and auto insurance company. We've got your back in life and death. The bastards are relentless. Flames swallow the perspective, and my monitor returns to its blue user interface. The speaker asks me, commercial or music? Break, I say. You have chosen the 30-second intermission. Enjoy your peace and quiet. I live for moments like this, stopped, waiting. On my way home from work, nothing but the hum of my idling monster, my monster and the monsters around me. Beside me, there's a red one growling on 20-inch wheels. Behind me, there's a little blue one shuffling and sniffling. The driver inside watching an advertisement on his dash monitor. The landscape runs a perfect horizontal course in most every direction. In front is the city where we live. Behind me is the city where we work. Beside our rows of cars, dirt is piled high, where orange monsters with black stripes groan and roar on tank tread. Their mouths drop into the dirt and yank up secrets that haven't been kept yet. 20 seconds remaining, say my speakers. In moments like this when I'm finally so close to silence, I feel like I can think clearly again. Gone are the squiggles that thump and jump in my temples. I have a choice. This is no dictatorship, no big brother dystopian hell of a government. The volume knob is right there. This is a fear of silence. My favorite moments, the moments of stillness, are only enjoyable whenever you know the noise is coming back, that the intermission comes to an end. I shiver in my shivering silver car monster to imagine going out, going on, without even a gentle ring in my ear. It's too lonely. 10 seconds of intermission remaining, say my speakers. I notice that the person in the big monster next to me has their window down and is looking at me. I roll down my window and oblige them. Howdy, partner. A man in a red hat says down to me, you want intermission too? Yep, 10 more seconds, I say. He looks at me with a pitying face. I can't tell if he feels bad that I'm about to lose my silence or if he's sad that I still have lo so long to wait before I return to it. He certainly didn't want to enjoy his moment of calm. He was just flirting with the idea. Heard they're gonna have this road fixed up by the end of next month. About time if you ask me, he says, his eyes surveying the landscape over his will. Yeah, about time, I say. The road will never be fixed. The construction will only move a couple of miles up the road next month. We'll just have to wait closer to home. Three seconds remaining, says the voice of my monster. The man looks back down to me as if he's seeing me off to war. His eyes harden, his mouth firms up. He points at his windshield, past it, to a billboard on the side of the road. He echoes the words printed, up and up to the future, partner. I roll my window up. Commercial or music, the voice asks. Commercial, I reply. There's a bouncy southern acoustic riff accompanied by a man's voice who says, trajectory, in a sustained gruff tone, like in the movie trailers, cut to a classroom. Um, whenever I started on this story, it kind of came to me in the form of shapes. And I thought a lot about, uh, with trajectory, I thought of a diagram where we kind of see the rise and fall of us in our progression, in our advancements. Uh, but I was also thinking of cycles and trying to kind of uh, put the two together to see that contrast uh, because oftentimes we only see one or the other. Um, it's very uh, quantitative whenever we look at ourselves on paper, uh, but whenever we're sitting uh, stopped at traffic and construction uh, and staring at the advertisements on the side of the road, it's a lot different. Um, I really haven't read live that much. I actually, uh, a couple of years ago, I was kind of considering finding, I, I wanted to find someone to read my stories for me <laughs> because I really don't like my voice that much. Uh, but last semester I had to read uh, my capstone story live or not live, but I had to record it and everything. So I was like, ah, what the heck, I'll just do it. So it isn't as big of a deal now. Um, whenever I read my story, I definitely feel it more. Um, it's different to write something and kind of, uh, kind of almost like with the writing process, when you ever you imagine a story as opposed to actually putting it on paper, um, it's very different. It's a very different um, outcome. And the same kind of goes with reading a story in your head and reading it aloud. 
um, especially with my style in the story where I try to make it kind of uh, stylistically like chunky and uh, really short and uh, sporadic. Um, it, it definitely, you, I feel like you kind of get into that rhythm a little bit more by reading it aloud. Really, I want to write stuff that makes people sad, but makes them really happy at the same time. Actually, that's not the way to put it. I want to make stories that make people want to cry and laugh at the same time. My, my uh, general inspiration growing up that really made me want to start writing was Kurt Vonnegut, of course. Uh, he also plays a lot with um, ironies and kind of uh, the black comedy, uh, black humor, and uh, just having that darkness where you don't know whether you want to laugh or cry. So uh, all you do is just kind of squeeze your face up and keep reading. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that was my main influence. And then of course I've studied a lot of speculative fiction and stuff in that realm now. So I have, uh, tons of authors that I'm constantly getting inspired by. Um, I wrote my first short story in 2018, I think. Um, but I've always written songs or stories or just anything really. I've always kind of just wanted to create something with words. But uh, once I started taking creative writing here, it really uh, locked me into writing stories. What do you hope to do with this? Uh, well, I don't really have any hopes uh, to like sell stories or anything like that. Uh, that's a, a, a big, broad dream uh, where I think you kind of have to, you have to sell it before you write it. And I'd rather just write stuff that I want to write um, so I write stuff and if it gets pub published, then it gets published. But if not, then it's not a big deal. This Tiger Media production was filmed in the William C. Thrash Television Studio Soundstage at East Central University.